क्या करूं क्या पिल लगेगा एडमिट करूं निकाल सकता हूं भाई हां कर दे विजन विजन ने किया ना पूरी आपने ये है ना वेरी क्या खत्म ओके यू गाइस आर हियर व्हाट इज दिस यू डू समथिंग ऑन द स्क्रीन यू नॉट मी हां ही यू डू समथिंग व्हाइट बोर्ड बंद कर दीजिए मतलब स्क्रीन वो करूं मतलब ज्यादा पीपल कैन अलाउड इट नो नो बट वी शुड इट शुड बी डिसेबल सो वी शुड डिसेबल द शेयर स्क्रीन ऑप्शन इफ आई वांट टू आई थॉट आई जस्ट डू द स्टॉप द शेयर नो नो डोंट इट्स ओके जस्ट कंटिन्यू ओके आर वी सेट या स्क्रीन वन या यू लाइक या आई एम रेडी गुड ओके इज लाइक या ओके बस मैं ये करूं ऐड करूं Okay, so, 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 Solo guys, okay. So, you can put it only the host can come. Uh, hello, and welcome to Chai and Why online version. I hope you've made yourselves a good cup of Chai because And as you know, in the times of this COVID crisis, we are doing this thing online. It's not perfect. Please bear with us. If you are watching us on Zoom, please make sure that your mic is muted and your video is off. If you want to ask questions, please use the chat channel to ask us questions. At the end of it, we may allow you to ask questions online, but as of now, just type out your questions. For those of us who are watching us on Facebook, welcome again. Please use the chat to ask questions. and before we start uh, today's session just a little bit about some useful sites uh, you know there is so much and so much of information and misinformation about uh, the corona virus it's best to look at sites which are reliable we recommend looking at the who site the world health organization or worldometer worldometer has many of these graphs which are going to be an integral part of today's talk uh, you can look at them in india also we have a lot of reliable websites we would really like to talk about this portal called covid gyan covid gyan is run by tifr and iisc and lot of other it's a multi institutional effort with india bioscience lots of institutions coming together to put out vetted content in many languages regional languages it's a very nice resource please take a look at it uh, there is a group of indian scientists who have come up with the inscicov website which has again a wealth of useful information in particular they have a series called the myth busters where they have uh, a, a lot of hoaxes about the virus which have been uh, you know uh, debunked again in various languages uh, the homi bhaba center for science education hpcse has a website called science simplified which has again a lot of uh, information in different languages so this is all about covid for chai and why the best thing to do is to follow us on social media both on facebook and twitter we will announce these events we are really uh, work you know tied up with many aspects of it and are working with very limited resources here so we will typically announce these things just you know we, usually we were announcing them almost a month ahead of time but now it's probably going to be in the week before the event uh, we will announce what's happening uh, and it will be as far as possible on both on zoom and on facebook live and definitely on facebook live so with this it's actually time to get into today's uh, session and today's session discusses something which you've definitely heard about in the last month or month and a half which is exponential growth exponential growth has been in the news because of covid-19 the rate at which cases are rising etc people said it's exponential but what is exponential growth it's something we thought it's a good idea to you know have a discussion about and exponential growth occurs everywhere all the way from games with rice grains and folk stories with rice grains to you know how computers have evolved over the years and of course the way diseases spread and today's session is actually um, it's not just a jugal bandi it's a quadruple bandi we have uh, three theorists 
Amol, Basu, and Rajdeep, and me, the experimentalist Arnab, we've sort of been mulling over some of what could be interesting. We've put together something. We don't know how we're going to do it. It's going to be very informal. So I think I'm going to let uh, Rajdeep get proceedings started off with and talk about some of the very introductory stuff about exponential growth. So all yours, Rajdeep. And the best part of it is, please remember, none of us are, we are not clinicians. We are not biologists. We know nothing about infectious diseases. So, you know, please keep your questions on the on the exponentials and the mathematics, etc. Uh, you know, I do semiconductors. Rajdeep works on statistical mechanics and things like that. Basu does uh, neutrinos and dark matter. Amol works on, again, phenomenology and neutrinos, etc. So we are just looking at the very basics of exponential growth. So over to Rajdeep. Thank you, Arnab. Uh, let's start our uh, let's start our discussion on exponential growth and see where we end up. Okay, let's start with a story which has been around for quite a while. This story has come up. I'll keep mine on. This story has come up in various uh, contexts. Uh, one of the ways it is told uh, is that there was an ancient king who was playing chess with a sage. And then he lost the game. Now he asked the sage, what does he want as a reward? And the sage said the following. Please give me one rice grain on the first square of the chess board. Two rice grain on the second. Four on the third. So that every time you go to the next chess board square, you double the number of rice grains. Okay. Now the king thought, this is a weird request, but he also thought this was a very small ask. Okay, so he was kind of amused and he said, okay, I will try to fulfill your wishes. But, but let's see what happens when the king tries to fulfill the wish of the sage. Here, what you will see is a video of what happens and how many rice grains you need as you start filling up the squares of the chessboard, okay? So what you see is that by the eighth square, you have 128. By the 10th square, you have 512. By the 11th square, you have thousand rice grains okay now let's see how the numbers increase see by the 15th 16th square you will have a very large number of rice grains it's about 32000 so now we are moving back out of the chessboard to fill it and looking at a typical kitchen okay and also remember it said that you have four here which is equal to 2 to the power 15. Okay, so four rice grains. Are, and you see very soon you will fill up your kitchen and you are moving into this is what we call a cathedral, a big charge. Okay, and you can see how the numbers are increasing as you are going now. Each time it's increasing very, very fast. Okay, so you see 36, 37, 38, 39, that by now you can't even fit it here. Okay. So now we are looking at some map of a city, a small size, size city. And let's see what happens. You gradually start filling up and one rice grain here is two to the power 20. You can see the numbers piling up. Now you have moved on to map of a small country like Switzerland. Okay. And again, as you see, you have not yet gone up to 64 and you see that you are basically cranking up your numbers very, 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 very large. Okay, so this super first growth is the magic of exponentials. Okay, this is what we want to explain today to you, how exponentials lead to a growth of numbers very, very, very fast. But let's ask one thing, what about the numbers? Okay, so let's calculate the total number of grains that you would need to fill up the 64 squares of the chessboard. Okay. Now I have written down a very, very large number for you, but let me try to explain 
what you would do if you try to say it out even forget about figuring out what it is so that part of the number is 95 lakh 51,615. The second part is 44 lakh 7,370 crores. Okay. And the last part is 1 lakh 84,467 crore crores. So you can see it's just a fantastically huge number. And when you have such very large numbers, it's easier if you try to divide them by some other numbers and try to get a sense of them rather than just saying them out aloud. Okay. So suppose I want to put all this rice into sacks, each of which weigh 100 kg. I will take the weight of a rice grain to be about 0 0.03 grams, which basically means 33 rice grains give you one gram. Okay. If I divide and I will see that I will get a large number of such sacks and I can read out that number, there will be 32,22,113. But in front of that, you will get 5,53,402 crores. That's a humongous number. So let's try to understand it by dividing by other large numbers again. Okay. So let's take the current world population. This is the world population from Worldometers at 8.30 a.m. today. Of course, it has changed by now, but let's go with it. It is about 778 crores, okay? If you divide by this number, you will see that everyone in the world will have 711 sacks each of 100 kg of rice if the king fulfilled the wish of the sage. That's the magic of X. That's how large this number is. Okay. So now this starting from this legend, we can come to more realist, more uh, things which are close to our life. Here are four graphs where you see this exponential growth. On the top left, you see the population of the world plotted as a function of time. And you see at some point the curve shoots up very, 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 very fast. And that's the exponential growth of population in the world. The curve on the top right hand side is the spread of Ebola as a function of time and the number of people who are getting infected in West Africa from 2014. We are, of course, in a similar situation today with COVID-19, but which is all over the world. But for that, Basu will take you through more details. So I will just tell you that if you have infectious diseases, at least in the initial part of the spread, the spread number of infected people can rise exponentially. The graph on the bottom left hand side is a spread of fire. So the X axis, the bottom axis is time and the Y axis is the distance which the fire has spread. And this particular graph is taken from a fire in a, something called a Grand Mulch in Nevada. And again, you can see that the distance the fire spreads goes up as the time goes up, uh, goes up and this goes in an exponential fashion. The last graph on the bottom right hand corner is a nuclear chain reaction uh, from uh, this is from some early piles in which were made in Chicago. And what you see is as you increase the number of piles more and more, the number of neutrons produced, which is the number of new nuclei which is produced, will go up, shoot up exponentially. Okay. So you see in very diverse situation, population to infectious disease, to spreading of fire, to nuclear chain reaction, you end up with this exponential or very, very, very fast growth of numbers. So that's what we would like to give you an idea about what are exponentials, what does this very fast means, and how do we think about that? So here is the question we would try to answer for you uh, in as simple a way as we can. What is an exponential? Okay. So the basic way to think about exponentials 
is in terms of repeated multiplications. Now you know if you add the same number n times, that is like multiplying the number by n. For example, if I add 2 5 times, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, that is 2 times 5, and that is 10. Okay? Now you can add other things. For example, you can add, put some sticks side by side. These green lines are the sticks. And you can put five of them together and you can ask, what is the total length of this? And this is five times the length of each stick. Now you can ask the same question where instead of adding, you start multiplying the same number n times, okay? Two times two times two times two times two, okay? And that is something we will call an exponential. There are two things in this exponential. We will talk of it as two, and there will be a subscript or something raised, which is five, which is the number of times you are multiplying. And this object, which is the number of times you are multiplying the basic thing, is called the exponent. And the thing that you are multiplying many, 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 many times, which is two here, is called the base. And in general, we will often say, base raised to the power of the exponent, base to the power exponent, and so on in colloquial terms. Of course, if you multiply 2 5 times, 2 to the power 5 becomes 32. But you don't have to stick to 2. You can take half, for example, and multiply half 3 times, and you will get half to the power 3. And in this case, it is 1 by 8, or 0 0.125. You can take the lengths, for example, and multiply length into a length. This time you will get an area of a square where each side is the length of a stick that I showed. Okay. So in general, if you take repeated multiplications, you will end up with an exponential. The thing that you are multiplying many times is the base, and the number of times you are multiplying is the exponent. Just remember these words and terminologies as we go forward. Where do we see multiple uh, multiplication or repeated multiplications in our life? Think of folding a paper. Okay, you fold a paper once, its thickness becomes twice because there are two layers of the paper now. Okay, so the thickness doubles. Now you can fold it once more. There are four layers. So the thickness is 2 into 2 or 4 times. If you fold it n times, the thickness is 2 to the power n times the original thickness because every time you are multiplying by a factor of 2. So this is one simple example where we will see exponentials in our daily life. More on that. You have all used some form of an ATM card, right? You would often have a four digit pin for your ATM card. And you have to basically either choose or you are given by the bank a four digit number. Okay. And this is your password. Now you can ask how many such passwords are possible. Okay. Or how many such pins are possible. So let's see, you have four slots and in the first slot, you can put anything between 0 and 9. These are the numbers you are allowed to put in. So there are 10 possible things you can put for the leftmost digit. Okay. Now for each of these, and this is the crucial part, that for each of these 10 possibilities, you can now put any of the 0 to 9 in the second slot. So you can put 10 things on the second slot. So if you only had two such slots, your total possibilities will be 10 into 10. Now you can carry this on for all the four slots and total number of possible pins would be 10 into 10 into 10 into 10. That's 10 to the power four and that's another exponential. You might have the other thing which you are always using. I don't know whether you think about it in that way when you are writing uh, numbers. So you write numbers like 3165. Okay, 3,165. What that means is you are taking 3 into 10 to the power 3, which is 1,000, plus adding to it 1 into 10 to the power 2, that is 100, plus 6 into 10 to the power 1, that is 6 into 10, that is 60, 
and then you are adding 5. Okay. Now, so you are always using exponents of 10 to write your decimal numbers. If you are a computer scientist or if you, or if you are a computer, you are using numbers which are written in binary, which can have only 0 or 1, not 0 to 9, okay, in each digit. And in that case, again, you are using something very similar. For example, if you have a number 1101, that means now 1 into 2 to the power 3. Remember, there are two things you can put in. So you are you're going to use exponents of 2. 1 into 2 to the power 3 plus 1 into 2 to the power 2 plus 0 into 2 to the power 1 plus 1. And so 1101 is 13. This is some ex uh, examples of exponentials in our daily life. More examples of exponentials and why we see exponentials in many, many processes is the following. Think of any of these processes like population growth, viral videos, how videos become viral, how disease spread, how rumors spread. You start a rumor and very soon you will see that a very large number of people actually believe it start believing in this rumor we have already shown you spread of fire you can have cancer cells which are growing very very fast and so on in each of this case the basic process works like this you start with one person okay for example in case of a cancer cell you start with one cell which then divides let's say into three cells okay if you are talking population growth you in a bacteria or something you have one cell let's say which creates two cells maybe two bacteria if you have a viral videos you you download you find it nice you tell three people who download these videos okay similarly in disease spread it may be you are infected and you infect three more three people okay i the basic process is then each of these three people or three of agents will again infect three more people Okay, and then each of those three people will infect three more people. And as you can see, you will in very soon in time, you will multiply three to the power n if you are looking at n, uh, n times the same process. And that's why you end up with exponentials in all of these cases. So remember that the basic process is one person infects, creates, talks to whatever three persons each of these three persons creates infects or talks to three other person and this continues on and on and this is what leads to multiple repeated multiplications or exponentials so this is exponential growth this is in a nutshell arnab and basu will tell you in more details later about this we gave you one example that exponential growth is super first. Let's think about one more example, which is folding paper. And I'll take thickness of a paper to be one tenth of a millimeter. Okay. So what happens if I make 10 folds of this paper, I end up with a length where thickness, which is about 10 centimeters or four inches for you to understand this is the size of your palm or the width of your palm, if you really were extra large, if you have a very large hand, four inches is more, it's more like 3.5 inches is the width of a typical palm, okay? So it's slightly larger than that. So you, are, you can stack up paper in thickness up to that point. You do 20 folds, you end up with about 104 meter, which is the length of a football field, okay? That's where that's you basically have paper stacked from one end of the football field to the other, and that's in 20 folds. If you have 30 folds, you end up with about 107 kilometer, which is the distance from TIFR to Lonavla, and roughly that's about 100 kilometers. So you can take all the way around, put papers all the way around, and go all the way up to Lonavla if you have taken a paper and made it into 30 folds. If you make it 42 folds, you will end up with a distance, which is a distance from Earth to Moon. Think about this. You started with a paper, which is one tenth of a millimeter. Okay. And then you folded it 42 times and you can stack it up all the way from the center of the Earth to the center of the Moon. 
okay and partly more than that okay this is basically exponential growth sorry so this is exponential growth so exponentials grow very very fast as the exponent increases the number of folds is the exponent you can ask what about the base suppose i keep the exponent fixed but i want to change the base well let's again take your four slots and let's say i allow you to put different things in this slots if i only allow you to put 0 and 1 you will get 2 to the power 4 or 16 passwords if i allow you to put 0 to 9 this is the atm pin we talked about you will get about 10000 passwords if i allow you to put any letter a to z in english okay that's 26 letters you will get 26 to the power 4 and that is about 4 lakh 56976 okay if i allow you uh, all letters all numbers all special characters i will get 95 to the power 4 and that is about 8 crores okay so you can see even by just increasing the number of things that you can put in the slot which is increasing the best exponentials can grow very 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 fast okay so this super first growth comes from repeated multiplications once again please remember that a little bit more if you want to multiply exponentials if you take 2 to the power n and multiply it with 2 to the power m that is multiplying 2 n times and then m times so it's like multiplying 2 n plus m times so you end up with 2 to the power n plus m so if you multiply exponentials you add the exponents okay if you divide you could have guessed that you actually subtract the exponents uh, 2 to the power n divided by 2 to the power m is n minus 2 to the power n minus m and now you can make the case that if m is uh, greater than n you see if the number of things that you are dividing is larger you will be left with half to the power n minus m uh, m minus n so you can in this way say that you can now make negative exponents which is 2 to the power n is half to the power n 2 to the power minus n is half to the power n okay and 2 to the power 0 it will be 1. you can also ask what happens if i exponentiate exponentials 2 to the power n to the power p which is multiplying 2 to the power n p times and this is 2 to the power n times p so if you exponentiate exponentials you multiply the exponents and then you can uh, ask similar questions like what is 2 to the power half it will be square root 2 and so on and you can basically extend this definition for exponents into all real numbers and we can think of 2 to the power x where x can be any real number okay now the last thing that you we want to talk to you about is the e in the exponential you will, may have often seen an exponential written as e to the power x so we want to talk a little bit about what this e is okay and to do that we will think about a simple a problem called simple versus compound interest so let's say you keep rupees thousand in a bank and the bank pays you an interest of five percent per annum or per year okay if it is calculated in simple interest so the you start with a thousand which is year zero then in first year five percent is five of hundred into one year into thousand which is what you kept and you add it to your bank account so you get thousand fifty when you are in the second year you simply add five over hundred into two into a thousand and you end up with eleven hundred and so if you are in the nth year you take 5 over 100 into n into 1000 and you add so in 5 years you will get 1250 in 10 years you will get 1500 rupees in your bank now in compound interest what you do for example you say for one year i will run simple interest but then for example after first year if in compound interest i get the same value which is 1050 and then instead of simply adding the interest more and more i will say this is my new principal amount that this is my new amount on this let me calculate simple interest for one more year okay 
So I will calculate 1050 into 1 plus 5 by 100, which is 1000 into 1 plus 5 by 100 whole square. And I will end up with 1102 and 50 paise, a little bit more. If I do it up to five years, every compounding every year, I will end up with 1276 instead of 1250. And if I go up to 10 years, I will end up with 1628 uh, rather than 1500 okay and this is the basic idea why if you keep a money in a bank after a lot of time it actually increases much faster than you would have thought which is a simple interest okay and you see that it's sorry if you you see another thing that you can the number of years is coming as an exponent here because that is the to the power we are going to raise various things just to show you a graph, if you kept 1,000 in a bank and if you went for 30 years, if you had simple interest, you will earn some, something slightly larger than 2,000 rupees. Whereas if you had a compound interest compounded every year, you will basically go more than 4,000 rupees. So compound interest makes it go faster. Exponentials grow faster than linear graphs. Now, what you can ask is a slightly different version of the problem. You say that I'm going to keep rupees one in a bank for one year. And I'm going to think of a bank that is very, 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 very generous and gives you 100% interest per annum. Okay. Uh, well, if you find such a bank, you should write back to me. I would like to keep my money there. But for the purpose of this, let's assume that such a bank exists. Okay. Now, however, the bank allows you to set the time after which interest is compounded. You can choose that you can compound it after six months, after three months, after every day, and so on and so forth. Now, what should you set so that your money grows for more and more? Okay, what is the number you should set? That's a question we want to ask. Let's see what happens. Okay, so if you compound it, Yearly, since you are keeping everything for a year, it's basically just simple interest. So since it's 100% in one year, one rupee will become, add one to it and become rupees two. Okay, it's one plus one to the power of one. Now suppose I ask the bank to compound my interest after six months, okay? So the bank will say, great, for the first six months, I get one plus half. Why do I get a half? Because it's 100% interest in a year, but I'm only going up to half a year. So that is one by two, okay? But then after six months, I get this one plus one by two and run again, simple interest for the next six months. So I get one plus one by two to the power two, okay? And I get 2.25. So this looks like better than rupees two and maybe, I can make the time after which things are compounded much smaller and I can get infinite amount of money. This might come to your mind. So let's see what happens if I decrease the time after which I am compounding the interest, okay? Or the bank is compounding the interest, okay? So in, if you are in three months, then you will get one plus one by four because you are running the simple interest for one fourth of a year to the power four, and that's 2.4414. If you go to one month, it's one over 12, you're running it for one twelfth of a year, and you will end up getting 2.61304. If you say, no, no, do it for a week, every week compound the interest, you will end up getting 2.6926. If you go to one day, which is, you are running for 1 over 365. You are running the simple interest for 1 over 365 of the year. And then taking this 365 times, you will end up with a number which is 2.7146. Now, you will see a pattern in the numbers, okay? If you are running it for 1 over n part of the year, you get a 1 plus 1 over n, okay? But then you are running it n times, so you are getting a 1 plus 1 over n to the power n, okay? So that's the pattern that will occur if I keep changing the time after which the simple interest is compounded. 
Also note that my idea of getting infinite money is not being realized. I start two, I get to 2.25, but then it goes to 2.44. And I have gone up to, from let's say, N equal to four to 365, and then I have only gone up to 2.71. Okay, so it doesn't look like this will go on and increase and become very, 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 very large. In fact, you can plot this function 1 plus 1 over uh, 1 over n to the power n as a function of n. These are the graphs and you will see that as you go to very, very large values, the number goes to very close to a value, which is 2.71828 and so on and so forth. This is called Euler's number or e okay and you can find it up to 50 digits on the internet so you this uh, decimal never ends if you really try to compute it and up to 50 digits you will get this number okay uh, this is okay don't ask me how people get this up to 50 digits okay uh, so now you can say what is e if you have a bank which is generous and gives you 100 percent interest per annum and you ask the bank to compound the interest every second not a day not a week every second your money at the end of year one is the value e correct up to seven decimal places okay so that's one way to think about e and then the exponential function you should think of exponential of x is e raised to the power x okay just like we said, you know, the exponent can become any number. So you just think of e raised to the power of that exponent. Uh, the graph on the top left shows that it again rises very, very fast. Okay. The graph on the top right shows, which is in a region which is between zero and two, is used to show that when you are going very close to zero, when you are at zero actually, the value of the function is one and not zero. And you cannot see this. Uh, from the big uh, graph on the left because the axis is squished and you should not be surprised because we said anything raised to the power zero is one so e raised to the power zero is also one okay now you can make a little bit more you can talk of an exponential of a times x remember if you are multiplying the exponents you are exponentiating an exponential we just told you a little while ago so you think of raising e first to the power a, whatever it is, and then raise that object to the power x. And on the right bottom, you have two curves, one for a equal to one and one for a equal to 0.75. And again, you can see both will rise very fast, but if a is larger, you will the curves will rise faster. Just one thing, remember, till now I have only talked about x's which are positive which is where everything will rise or ax which is positive and this is what is required for exponential growth if we go to negative values of this we will see that this falls off very fast but that's not the topic of today's talk so we will not talk about it today maybe some other day we'll talk about that the last thing before i hand it back to my colleagues about exponentials i want to talk to about you about how to tell what is a real exponential you know you can be given many many curves some which are not linear which are rising you know and you can be told oh this is an exponential growth oh that is an exponential growth maybe there are some investors who want to invest you in a company and they say oh you know the company's earnings are growing exponentially and they show you a chart which is rising okay but are, are all rising graphs exponential? No. Okay. So there is a way you can test if someone gives you a curve, whether it, it, it's a real exponential or it's a fake one. Someone is just calling it an exponential. It's some other function. Okay. So here is how it goes. Take that curve. Okay. And take a segment on the x axis. For example, I am taking a segment which is between two and three okay so this is my segment which i will uh, look at take the ratio of the function value at three and the function value at two exponential of three use the mouse if you can use the mouse because you can't point to this okay 
if you want to find. Yeah, that's fine. So, so uh, take the ratio of the function value at three and the function value at two. So at the two ends of the segment. Okay. Let's evaluate this for three and two. You will see that this answer is 2.718. Now go and take some other segment. Okay. So I'm taking another segment which is between four and five. But this segment must have the same length as the earlier segment that you took. You see, three minus two is one, and I'm taking again a segment of length one, which is five minus four. Again, follow the same procedure. Take the ratio of the function value at five and at four. Exponential of five divided by exponential of four. Now see, exponential of five is not exponential of three. It's very different, 148 versus 20. Exponential of 4 is not exponential of 2. Exponential of 4 is 54. Exponential of 2 is about 7.3. However, if I take the ratio of exponential of 5 divided by exponential of 4, I get the same number, 2.718, as I get exponential of 3 divided by exponential of 2. Now, you can take this segment anywhere. You could have taken 2.5 to 3.5. You could have taken uh, 0 to 1. You could have taken 1.5 to 2.5 anywhere. You just have to make sure that the two segments you are taking have equal length. And then the ratio of the function value at the two ends must be same for an exponential. Okay. This is the way you can quickly test whether something is an exponential. Just take equal segments, take the ratios and see how close or whether they are close enough. OK, now that gives us a new idea of basically looking at a scale. See, when we look at scales in the x axis, for example, you see 0 to 2 and 2 to 4 has the same physical length on your screen. OK, which means what we are saying is this is actually equal numbers 2 minus 0 and 4 minus 2. And that's what we are representing by equal lengths. On the y axis, 0 to 500 and 500 to 1000 has the same length because if I subtract 1000 to uh, 500 from 1000, I get 500. If I subtract 0 from, 500, I, uh, 500, uh, 0 from 500, I get 500. So equal subtractions are given as equal length. Now suppose you can find a scale or represent this in a way but equal ratios are equal lengths, okay? So if you look at the gra graph on the right-hand side, it's called log scale. And if you look at the y-axis, you will see the distance between 1 and 10 is the same as the distance between 10 and 100. Remember, 100 minus 10 is not 10 minus 1. 100 minus 10 is 90, 10 minus 1 is 9, okay? However, 100 divided by 10 is 10. And 10 divided by 1 is 1. So on the y-axis, what we are doing is we are representing equal ratios by equal distances. And this is called a log scale. And once you have a log scale, if you are plotting an exponential in a log scale, see, equal distances in x should have given you equal ratios, which now should look like equal distances on the y-axis. And hence, that's a characteristic of a straight line. If I take a particular distance along x, I have to go up a particular distance along y to again make that curve. Okay? So all exponentials will look like a straight line on a log scale. And you will see this later when Arnab and Basu will show maybe a few data when might be plotted in the log scale. And just remember to see whether something is exponential on a log scale you should ask, does it look like a straight line? Okay. Now, with this, I would end my section. And of course, uh, let me end with the, without, not without addressing the elephant in the room, why we are all here, why you are not getting chai, why we are doing it on social media and so on. It's a COVID-19 uh, infections that is spreading all over the world. And here again uh, in the curve, you see data for different countries. I will not comment on the data. Basu will talk more detail about uh, how the data looks like and so on. I would just like to point out one thing that 
the y axis is a log scale so equal ratios are equal distances and i will leave it up to you to say see whether something looks linear or like a straight line or what part of the curve looks like a straight line for different countries that we have here and uh, this will be explained in more details for basu i will now hand over to arnab who will um, talk to you more about exponentials in growth of computer uh, chips and so on and so forth Uh, we are not taking questions in between, right? We'll take uh, questions no, we'll at, take the them at the end. People end. can write questions. Yeah. Or not. Okay. Okay, just give us a minute. Actually, I should get rid of this because otherwise I'll be hearing myself with a lag. Um, we'll also just... Okay. Is your mic on? Just give us a minute. There was an issue with the Zoom. But by the way, while the screen is there, if you can see the screen, uh, you can clearly see that definitely for most of the countries. Oops, we lost the screen. Uh, Okay. You can mute me on that. Zoom audience, can you hear us? Can somebody just type in if you can hear us on Zoom? Can you turn the audio piece off the speaker? I can hear myself. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to try and take over from this point on. And uh, one thing which you see on this, on the curve for this, is certainly there are regions in which the curve is straight on a graph whose y axis is in terms of these, what is called a log scale, with equal divisions representing equal ratios. And you can see that the slopes of these curves change, and that is a lot of what we will hear about later when we discuss the growth of epidemics. But I'm actually going to take a completely different line here and go on to talk about I need the PowerPoint screen this is the zoom screen and I, I mean uh, arrows no okay we fixed the audio but we've lost our screen sharing option here Ah, this is the one. Okay, great. Okay, so let's get back. We're going to go now from this COVID and infectious diseases, something very different, the world of computers, and hopefully you've heard of something called Moore's Law. Now, Moore's Law was actually a sort of prediction made way back in 1965 by Gordon Moore, whose picture you see here, who said that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit will double approximately every two years okay and let's see what has happened in the last about 50 55 years and actually today is april 19th moore made this prediction it was published in the electronics magazine april 19th 1965 so 55 years ago exactly and moore said what he said was this as costs fall remember it's costs fall the number of components that can be put on an integrated chip he gives a prediction for 10 years in 1975, you can fit 65,000 components on a, on a single silicon chip. So he sort of extrapolated this. Please remember that Moore's law is not a law of physics. If at all, it's a law of economics because he talks about unit costs that are changing. And what has happened? Moore had an amazing insight. He actually had only four data points. He had data points from 1962 to about 65, four data points. And in this, of course, he's plotting not as, remember, it's a log scale, but it's log to the base two in this case, right? He plotted on a log scale, got a straight line and said, okay, for the next 10 years, we will go on this curve and we will be at about 65,000 
components 2 raised to 16 6 5 5 3 6 so that's what he predicted but it's not just 10 years it's now been 55 years and for 55 years on a logarithmic scale we are still you can see that the slope of this is approximately approximately linear if you see the the slope this slope is approximately linear which means the number of transistors has been doubling and earlier your first ic's probably had just a couple of thousand chips on it the intel 4004 today you have more than 50 billion of them in the modern computer uh, chips that run uh, your laptops and other processors um, uh, today this is of course moore's law and uh, you know the number of transistors that we make have really reached numbers which you typically hear only in astronomy so both what you see remember it's a law of economics so the number of transistors made per year is the left axis the one which in red you've gone from you know 1955 was 10 raised to somewhere less than 10 raised to 8 transistors per year now you're at 10 raised to 20 uh, this is in the first 50 years of moore's law and the cost has also come down similarly by a factor of 10 billion the cost per transistor has come down now numbers like 10 raised to 20 these exponentials have one problem you very quickly get into these huge numbers you know Rajdeep had these number of grains on a chessboard, etc., which really boggle the mind. But let's compare it with numbers in astronomy. So the year Moore's law in the 50th anniversary, end of 2014, semiconductor facilities made, as you saw in the last graph, 2.510 to the 20 transistors. What does this mean? If it was Carl Sagan giving the talk, he would have said 250 billion billion transistors, which means in every second of the year. 8 trillion transistors were made every second every second more transistors weighed 25 times more than the number of stars in the milky way 75 times more transistors made every second than the number of galaxies in the known universe astronomy comes with big numbers but remember that there are a huge number of transistors being made in every chip that's going into mobile phones and, and laptops and computers and everything else right and the idea with exponentials is things add up very quickly in, 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 the, you know, in the final stages. So, you know, more transistors were made in 2014 than the sum of all the transistors from the beginning in 1955 to 2011. And this is not just about transistors. Computer memory has expanded similarly earlier. If you're my age, you remember 256 kilobyte floppy disks. Now you have terabytes of, of storage in approximately the same space. So the cost of computer storage and of thing again this is a log scale of course this is going down it's plotted in terms of you know uh, the, the price per megabyte that you paid but the total amount of megabytes that you can get for a given price also has consequently gone up so these are again exponentially scaling and this is what actually enables you to have a lap uh, a very powerful computer in your pocket or your, your laptop or whatever this is what enables data transmission to happen this is what enables you to see us online and have the stock and there are always you know exponentials showing up in every places the same models that are used to predict the growth of diseases you can be used to model other pandemics as well there are videos that spread virally and the most famous case where a lot of analysis was done was this movie you know the horse step opa gangnam style size video now the, the blue curve is was the earlier record holder on youtube baby the red curve over here is size Gangnam style. It was the first video to hit a billion views. And you can see the slope. You can see the slope. This is this is on a linear scale. It's going up, up, up very uh, fast. It was an exponential growth. And you know, physicists love modeling this kind of stuff, right? There are people who write papers on looking, analyzing how these videos spread, the viral spread of size Gangnam style video. Okay, and if you look at the graphs in these papers and the kind of models they do, you will see that they are very, very similar. The kind of, if you've been following the COVID news, people are, you know, looking at the graph of how this was a New York Times thing showing how one person infects five and then they infect a few more people, uh, two and a half people or something, no, 2.6 people, and it, it spreads. There are similar graphs of how these videos spread. So you can use the same mathematical techniques that people use for looking at epidemics to look at viral videos, because all of them at the heart of it are spreading exponentially. It's the exponential growth. And remember, just as in those curves, initially you thought, you know, uh, there was China's exponential growth. Then we saw Italy suddenly taking over and the growth rate of Italy was very high. And then the US growth of rate rise made Italy looks look small. That's exactly what's happened. This was Gangnam style. Initially we saw an exponential, 
going up. That's a black curve to the left. And now, 2017, you had Despacito, which is going up and has crossed this to become the world's most viewed video. So all these things follow exponential growth. So just a little aside to say that exponentials come everywhere, not just in epidemics or rice grains, but also in computer performance and viral videos. OK, so let's take a look at this a little bit more and say that do exponentials go on forever? Can you just keep growing on? Can you keep growing on? And to do that, we need Basu. Where is Basu? Basu, Basu, we need you here. Social distancing, I must move away. Basu will appear and we'll continue. All right, uh, so I'm Basu, and I'll tell you a little bit about how exponential growth ends. So we've seen that exponential growth leads to very large numbers very quickly, especially towards the end stages of this growth. In the real world, growth or even existence of such large number of objects, they could be people, they could be transistors, they could be video views, requires resources. In the case of people or animals, it requires food. In the case of uh, viral videos, you need uh, you know, new people to be watching those computer uh, uh, videos. Uh, so these resources are not infinite. We live in a finite world, and these resources that we have in our world are limited. And so this exponential growth that you see early on does not last forever. Often also a predator will keep the exponential growth of uh, one of these things in check. For example, if a company is growing exponentially, a competitor company might come in and that would slow down the growth of this first company. Okay, so such features of our world end the exponential growth. So in the case of the rice grains on the chessboard, the total amount of grains in this chessboard cannot be the total amount of rice that is there on Okay, so that's that's how it will stop. Uh, Moore's law will slow down when we use up all the silicon that's available in a given year. Epidemics stop when everyone is either infected or immune or God forbid dead. Population growth slows down mainly due to social changes due to better education and people stop having uh, as many children as they were having before viral videos eventually everyone watches them and the novelty wears off nobody wants to be recrolled ever again uh, so that's how viral videos uh, stop uh, but now we want to focus on two specific examples of how this exponential growth ends the first example is the one of rabbits growing, you know, reproducing in a forest and their numbers growing. So suppose that there are a hundred rabbits that find a new forest. These rabbits reproduce and their population growth is roughly at a rate of 10% every year. Now this is not unusual for rabbits that have enough food and the right uh, kind of circumstance. Let's ask how many rabbits do we have after some number of months? So what you see on this table here is uh, I list the number of months after the zeroth month where I have 100 rabbits. And then I ask after so many months, how many rabbits do I have? So after the first month, I have 110 rabbits, 110 is 100 plus 10 percent of 100 which is 10 so 100 plus 10 is 110 that's the number of rabbits after the first month after the second month i have 10 percent growth over the 110 so 10 percent of 110 is 11 and so i add 11 to 110 and i get 121 rabbits at the end of the second month then i fast forward a little bit and i ask how many rabbits do i have at the end of the sixth month and I find that I have 177 rabbits after six months. After a year, which is 12 months, I have 314 rabbits. After two years, I get 985 rabbits. After five years, more than 30,000. After 15 years, more than 2.8 billion. That's a big number. And if I let this run for 20 years, 
I get 859 billion rabbits. Now these numbers towards the end are unbelievably large and they would never happen. The question is why? You see, these numbers grow especially fast towards the end. The growth rate is the same. It's 10% year on year or month on month. But the 10% is acting on a much bigger number towards the end. So the absolute growth is very large towards the end. In this curve that you see here on your screen, the y-axis is not a log scale. It's a usual linear scale. Equal distances refer to equal number of rabbits growing in a given number of months being shown on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis. So the fact that this number of rabbits is growing very fast towards the end is not because the growth rate has changed. The growth rate is still 10%. But this 10% is acting on a much bigger number at later times. This is what leads to huge uncontrolled growth of an exponential. That the same growth rate acts on a bigger and bigger number as time goes on. Now let's formalize this thinking a little bit. Excuse uh, the algebra. Uh, this is not hard. You will see that, uh, you know, this is not uh, too hard to understand. Suppose I want to find out what is the rabbit population after n months, given the population in the 0th month. So in the 0th month, I had 100 rabbits in the example that I just showed you before. That I write as P subscript 0, you know, P sub 0. And if I want to know what is the population at the end of the nth month, what I should do is I multiply P subscript 0 with 1 plus the growth rate raised to the power n as Rajdeep had already showed us. This is the same story as compound interest. You have 1 plus the growth rate raised to the power the number of times you apply this growth rate. Okay. So P sub n, which is the population in the nth month, is 1 plus g to the power n multiplying p sub 0. So in our, st in our story of these rabbits, g is 0.1, 10%. And so I have to take 1.1 to the nth power and multiply it to the initial population of rabbits. This g is called the growth factor. This equation uh, is useful, but there's another way of looking at this equation. So suppose I want to ask, Given the population at the end of the nth month, what is the population at the end of the n plus 1th month? Okay, and the answer in this case is even more simple. You just simply multiply the population by 1 plus g because that's the growth rate. You know, in every, in every month, the population increases by a factor of 10%. So you had pn at the end of the nth month and you add to it g times pn and that's the population at the end of the n plus 1th month. In other words, if I subtract the population at the end of the nth month, which is p sub n, from the population at the end of the n plus 1th month, which is p sub n plus 1, I get g times pn. This is say that these three equations are three different ways of saying exactly the same thing. So the net increase at the end of the n plus 1th month is the growth factor g multiplying the population at the end of the nth month, which is p sub n. Now suppose the forest has food to support only a maximum of 10,000 rabbits. How will this growth change? The simplest idea that we can use is that the growth rate must become also proportional to the available resources. So suppose you had a forest which allows a maximum of 10,000 rabbits to exist, whether because of food or space or whatever, the, the resources that are already being used is P sub n divided by this large 
largest allowed population, which is P sub, P sub max. So this Pn by P max is the used capacity of the forest. Now the new rabbits which will have to be born have access only to the unused capacity of the forest, which is one minus the used capacity. And so therefore, the growth in the n plus one th month, so P sub n plus one minus Pn, so this is the growth in the nth month, must be proportional to Pn as it was before, this sub P sub n, the growth factor G, which I have not changed, but in addition, it is proportional to this factor of one minus P sub n divided by the maximum population, which is called the carrying capacity. Once I change this rule of how the population at the end of the n plus one month looks relative to the population at the end of the nth month, we find a totally different kind of growth. You see, initially this looks very similar to what we had in the case of infinite food at the end of the zero at the at at the end of the zero month, I had 100 rabbits. At the end of the first month, I have 110 in the case with infinite food, and the same roughly in the case with uh, uh, food only for 10,000 rabbits. At the end of the second month, 121 and 121, not very different. Uh, at the end of the third month, 133 and 133, same as what we had before, no change. By the sixth month, I start seeing a difference. I see 177 with infinite food and 176 with finite amount of food. By the end of a year, I start seeing a noticeable difference. 314 rabbits with infinite food available, 308 rabbits with finite amount of food available for 10,000 rabbits. And this is all simply using these two equations. So given the population in the nth month and some growth rate, you can find the population in the n plus one month. Same as here. So suppose you are given P sub n in the zeroth month is 100, then you plug 100 here, uh, P max is 10,000, uh, G is 0.1, P n is again 100, and you get P n plus one as uh, P in the case n equal to zero, P n plus one is P one, which will turn out to be 110. And you keep repeating this, you know, this is called recursion, you keep repeating this and you get these numbers. But notice what happens once you go past about a year. In about five years, we had seen that with infinite food, there would be more than 30,000 rabbits. But now with finite amount of food, we get only about 7,800 rabbits, significantly less. In about 15 years, whereas we had more than 2.8 billion rabbits, I saturate at about 10,000 rabbits, which is the carrying capacity of this forest, which is what we assumed. Even if we go all the way to 20 years, you know, long way into the future. In the earlier case, I was getting more than 800 billion rabbits. I don't get that anymore. I get 10,000 rabbits. So the population of rabbits has stabilized over time. This kind of growth is called logistic growth. This is shown in this uh, picture that I uh, now display on your screen. On the vertical axis is the number of rabbits in linear scale. So equal distances on the vertical scale refer to equal number of rabbits growing as a function of time, which is shown on the horizontal scale in number of months. As you can see, up to about a year or maybe a year and a half, these two, this green and red curves, they are very, very similar. So the red one is the exponential growth and the green one is this new kind of growth that I just told you about called logistic growth. And they are very similar until about a year and a half in this example. But after that, whereas the exponential growth keeps rising, and becomes absurdly large. In the case of the logistic growth, this number saturates to some value, which is the carrying capacity of the system. In this case, 10,000 rabbits. So this is one way in which exponential growth ends. 
Now I'll tell you about a second example of how exponential growth ends. And this is related to the fact that none of the rabbits were dying in the previous example. In the case of diseases, people get better, you know. So although the infectious people, number of infectious people rises exponentially or logistically, eventually this number will come down again because people will get better. In this SIR model of ep epidemics, which is being used uh, very often uh, to look at how the number of uh, infected patients is changing in different uh, countries, uh, especially uh, you know in these days, the main new feature is that this number of infectious people first increases as an exponential, then saturates like a logistic curve, but then eventually decreases because these people get better. So this is what we want to show now. So in, so in this case, we will have to think of three different classes of people. The first is the susceptible class, people who are healthy, but they can get infected. So this is S. Then the next compartment, the next class is infectious people, people who have the disease and can infect other people. And the third are people who were infectious, but have now gotten better and do not infect anybody else anymore. So this is an idealization. Most diseases do not exactly fit into this paradigm. It can happen that people are infectious, but not, uh, uh, you know, uh, who have the disease, but cannot infect others or people who are not showing symptoms, but can infect others. Things can get significantly more complicated. And this is why we need epidemiologists to look at any specific situation, but our objective here is to just get a feeling for how number of infectious people increases and decreases in any generic epidemic. So remember the total number of people n in our uh, let's say village is s plus i plus r. Now this numbers s, i and r are time dependent. So on day zero I could have in, in a population of a thousand people, 999 healthy people, which would be S, and one infected person, which would be I, and zero recovered people, because the only infected person has not yet recovered. But then as time goes on, these numbers will change. So just as I did in the case of the rabbit population, I will now represent the numbers S, I, and R, in a time dependent way, I have attached what is called a subscript to each of these. So S sub N, I sub N and R sub N and S sub zero would be the number of susceptible people on the zero th day. Uh, I sub zero would be the number of infectious people on the zero th day and so on. How do these numbers change with time? So here is a scary looking equation, but bear with me. It's exactly the same thing that you saw in the rabbit example. What I am saying here is that the number of infectious people on the n plus one -th day minus the number of infectious people on the n -th day, which is the number of newly infected people on the n plus one -th day. So the number of new infections that happen after the nth day what is this proportional to? Forget about the second term for now. Just look at this one. It is proportional to some growth rate G, which we had before, times this factor. Now this needs some explaining. Explaining. You see, new infections occur when a healthy person or a susceptible person meets an infectious person. Okay. So my newly infected people must be proportional to the number of susceptible people and these people are meeting lots of other people at random so the chance that they meet an infectious person is the number of infectious people on that day divided by the total population okay so suppose each healthy person is meeting g people in a given day the chance that out of g some number of people are infectious is i sub n divided by n so that's the first term on the right hand side of this equation this is what 
leads to increase in the number of infectious people. What is this second term? This second term is decreasing the number of infectious people because there's a minus sign. And how is it decreasing? It is saying that some fraction R of the infectious people on the end of the day get better, they recover. These two numbers, the growth rate and the recovery rate, are different for every epidemic. But these are the two numbers that you need to describe any given epidemic using this sort of a model. G is the number of people met per day, R is the fraction of people recovered per day. Now there are equations for S and R as well. It's very simple to see that the, num that the increase in the number of susceptible people is exactly the negative of this term or in other words that the number of susceptible people decreases by how much? By exactly the number of newly infected people which is the same term and the number of recovered people is exactly the number of infectious people who have decreased because of their recovery which is exactly this term. So these equations similar to what we saw in the case of rabbits tell how the numbers of healthy, infectious and recovered people changes as a function of time, in this case days. So suppose we take a village with 1000 people and in this village only one person is infected on day zero. But this village is, you know, very uh, social and everyone is meeting everyone and on an average each person meets about 20 other people in a week. And the disease is of the kind that it takes about 15 days for one person to recover, so two weeks or so. And uh, this is roughly similar to what is expected for the coronavirus and uh, for our usual uh, social life. Typically, you meet about 20 unique individuals in a week. Uh, and maybe, it, so for some people it could be 100, for some people it could be 10, but let's say somewhere between 20 and 50. And the typical recovery rate is in about two weeks. In such a case, what you find is that the number of infectious people, this red curve, it rises very quickly, you know, and it goes to about 90% of the population within a few days, within less than five days. And this could be too bad if 90% of a village needs hospitalization or medical care, this may not be available. So this is a very fast epidemic and we should ask how can we control this epidemic? So the main problem is that too many healthy people are meeting the infectious people while this epidemic is going on. This ratio of G over R, the, now the typical contacts per week, divide, contacts per day divided by typical recovery rate, this number is the R naught. You know, in epidemiology language, this is the defining feature of this epidemic. The larger the R0, the faster the epidemic grows. So infection uh, rises exponentially first, then peaks essentially because of the logistic uh, behavior, and then falls off because of this recovery rate. But this initial rise is strongly governed by this ratio of G over R, which is R0. Suppose now that we use social distancing or limited contact, as we call it, and say that people should only meet their close family within their own houses. So that reduces the number of contacts to about three to four per week. And the recovery rate doesn't change because that's not in our hands. That's uh, what the, you know, the disease uh, controls. Given this, now you see that the infectious population rises only maximum to about 60% of the full population and it takes a bit longer to do so, you will also find that the total number of infected people is somewhat smaller, though that is not a large effect. So just by reducing the number of contacts, we have slowed the epidemic down. Okay. This is because healthy people are no longer meeting infectious people as frequently. And ideally, we would just simply not meet the infectious people. 
But since we have no way of knowing who is infectious and who is not, the correct strategy is to just not meet anyone unless necessary. This is the power of social distancing to flatten the curve. You know, you must have heard these words again and again. I hope this example gave you some insight into how social distancing leads to flattening the curve and slowing down of an epidemic. So finally, how is India doing with the coronavirus? The last two plots that I showed you, they were not the coronavirus. Uh, they were uh, just some examples similar to the coronavirus. Now you see, this is a log plot. The vertical scale has a logarithmic scale. Equal distances on the vertical scale refer to equal ratios. No, equal multiplying factors and the x-axis is linear which is that the equal distances refer to equal number of days different countries are shown here so this is india right in the middle uh, there are countries uh, which have a curve that's higher than ours so italy china united states quite a few of them so the ones that you can't see in gray are the other countries that i have uh, uh, suppressed uh, so that we can see these few curves properly but then there are curves uh, from Japan and Sri Lanka that are significantly slower one thing to notice for all of these curves is that in the initial period so for, until about let's say 20 days after the 100 confirmed case as is being shown in this plot this curve is linear on a log plot which means that the infection was growing exponentially, but this exponential growth rate is not the same for every country. And that is probably because of the different degree of social distancing, different degree of uh, contact that people have in these countries. Perhaps there are other factors that we are not yet aware of. We don't know. But uh, it is true that in all of these countries, the infections did grow exponentially in the early days. Countries like Italy, for sure, China, perhaps also India and United States, their curves are now flattening. This is in part, at least because of the social distancing or limited contact measures uh, that we have applied. We hope that these numbers will come down over time and that's when the epidemic will end, once this curve falls down. Okay, so we'll not tell you a lot more about COVID-19 because this is uh, a separate uh, subject matter. Uh, the idea here was to tell you a little bit about the exponential growth of various kinds of things and in particular how it relates to growth of epidemics. So with that, I think I'll stop and uh, I'll invite Erna back uh, uh, to take over and uh, maybe we can answer some questions. Okay, so, uh, so it's time for taking questions now. So if you're on Facebook, you could type in your questions. If you're on Zoom, you can also uh, type in your questions. And let's see who's asking questions here. And we'll see uh, who's, uh, which one of us, you know, can answer the question. Uh, okay, Amol, any questions on Facebook? Yeah, so there is uh, one by Umesh. Uh, this is, I think, perhaps for Basu. Uh, he asked, what happens to the deceased people in the body that you showed? Okay. So, uh, the question is by Unmesh and he is asking that what happens to the infected people in the model that I showed. So, I have the infected people recovering after some number of days, in this case, 15 days. And I assume that no one dies. You, if you want, uh, if you want to be a little bit more accurate or uh, morbid, let's say, uh, you include both recovered and dead within the same compartment. You know, so some part of this blue curve includes people who have died. Typically for, you know, the kind of epidemics that we're talking about, say the coronavirus or flu or even uh, chicken pox, this number of dead people is rather small. Although, you know, every, you know, every life is important and we shouldn't, uh, you know, 
we sh uh, you know we shouldn't say that this is a small number of deaths but from the point of just looking at the numbers it's about a few percent of the people who do not make it at the end of the disease if you want to be very accurate you can add that in but doesn't so change question to here is about this thing you mentioned as r naught and uh, we do keep on reading about r naught sometimes so can you talk more about r naught what it is and when we read r naught what do you understand from it in fact that's the same question on zoom uh, being asked as well uh, could you please explain what is r naught yes uh, so the question is what is r naught you will hear this term being used many times in articles in uh, in the television uh, so r naught is a number that describes how fast an epidemic grows this number is always derived within some model in this case, I have this model known as the SIR model or the Susceptible Infectious Recovered Model. There are other models and for any one of these models, the R0 definition changes. So anyone who tells you what, you know, the R0 of this disease is so and so, let's say 2.7, you should ask under what assumptions. Typically the R0 that is you know being derived for uh, the disease that you're talk talking about somewhere between two and four depending on what kind of model assumptions we make this is not a number that is known very precisely uh, you know uh, without a lot of uh, you know data analysis uh, but you know this is a number that's useful in making policy decisions uh, so people try to find this number with whatever data they have uh, in this model, in the SIR model, R0 happens to be the ratio of the growth rate to the recovery rate. Okay, so for example, I think in this, uh, in this example where we have 20 contacts per week and uh, half a recovery in a week, R0 is uh, 40. And that's a very, very large R0. Whereas in this case where I have three and a half contacts per week, and 0.5 recoveries per week i have an r naught of 7 which is also extremely large uh, but uh, closer to the real world values of about 3.54 is it fair to say that you should try to decrease the value of r naught yes that, uh, indeed so uh, we should can you repeat the question please yeah so the question was should we try to decrease the value of r naught the answer is absolutely yes because R0, at least within this model, and to be honest, in any model of epidemiology, will have some contribution from the growth rate and some contribution from the recovery rate. The recovery rate is more difficult to control because that depends on having some good medicine or good level of care, but the growth rate really depends on people meeting other people, and that's something that we can control. That's something that we can reduce, so if we decrease the number of people that we meet in our day-to-day -day lives while the epidemic is on, that would decrease the numerator of this R0, G over R, and that would decrease R0. So indeed, we should absolutely try to decrease R0 by decreasing the number of contacts. Uh, Maybe I can add just one more thing, given this is on exponentials, uh, that the very initial uh, exponential will be governed by this parameter r naught so if you are worried about so if you are worried about how fast this disease is going to grow here uh, and not how it's going to saturate and other things but somewhere very much here that's where you will see that r naught will play a role so the smaller you make r naught in whatever models that you are using, uh, the initial growth will be less and less steep. I think that's the other point about in terms of exponential. So here's a related question from uh, Taran. Okay, there's a related question on R naught. Does R naught depend on like local factors? Does it depend on the country and you know situations, etc. Okay, so the question is, does R0 depend on some local factor? This is a very good question, excellent question. Uh, you see, this is why 
more detailed modeling is important. This model takes all the people and does not really tell you how far away these people live from each other. Uh, do they uh, live in a region where there's a lot of population density or do they live very far away from each other? It also does not include effects like, let's say, temperature or, uh, you know, uh, other hygiene measures, which can reduce the rate at which infections spread. For example, just simply wearing a mask, which I'm sorry, I'm not wearing one now because uh, it's harder to talk, uh, but I assure you, I'm very far away from everyone else here. Uh, but simple things like wearing a mask or, uh, you know, washing your hands uh, using a hand sanitizer, these also affect R0, but this is not included in this model because this model does not model the effects of how the infection spreads from one person to another. We just assume that the rate of spreading from an infectious person to a susceptible person is unchanged. So the only thing that we can control in this model are how many contacts, how many meetings we get. This is really an important part of the model, but there are other things that we could add, including modeling how far they live from each other, what's the temperature, are there hygiene measures being used, and those would also influence R0. So great question. Okay, let's see if we have questions on Facebook. Yes, somebody. Yeah, so this is a, again a question about uh, a model. So of course this was a, a very simplistic model. Uh, people have heard about models that have second waves of infection and so on. Uh, how do people take care of it? Or can you just maybe simply indicate uh, what you would do if you want to model such a thing? I see. So the question is that in this model, if you ran it for enough time, the infection never rises again. But is it possible to model epidemics where the infections rise and fall and then they rise again? Indeed, uh, this would not happen in an SIR, in, in an SIR model, uh, but, uh, and it's a bit more uh, complicated uh, to do, but a simple way to think about it would be removing an assumption that we have made in our model. So we have assumed that the recovered people, the people being shown in this blue line here, they are never getting infected again. Now this is a, an assumption that we've made. Uh, if you see in this equation, R never decreases. The number of recovered people never decreases. The number of susceptible people does not get a contribution from R. We could add a term where the number of recovered people decreases at some rate, let's say loss of immunity. So I would subtract minus L times Rn, which is the immunity loss rate. And that number would get added to the susceptible population. And let's say this immunity is lost over 10 years. Okay, so in about 10 years after the first wave of infection, we will again convert all the recovered people to susceptible. And if there is any one infectious person that enters the village at that point, we will have a second wave of infections. So that's how you will modify this, uh, how you would modify this model to account for second wave of infections. Great question. Thank you. Okay, uh, so there is a question, I think, this would be for Rajdeep. Uh, in an exponential curve, after some values of x, the y values seem to suddenly increase. What factors are responsible for that? Okay, so. Um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is that if you take an exponential curve, it seems that it's very small for some time, and after a certain number, the curve, for example, uh, seems to be increasing very fast. And the answer is why and what controls that. Uh, Basu gave a part of this answer, which is saying that, you know, as you, uh, in an exponential curve, one more thing happens, one more property happens, that the rate of change of the curve, which is how much it grows, divided by how far you are going in x. And if you take slow. x, some very, very small values and gradually go there. 
uh, that would get, get you to the slope. So uh, that itself is proportional to the function value itself, which is what Basu was saying that towards the end, the rise seems to be very, very high. And that's partly because of this property of exponentials. And so what you, when you see this uh, factor, what you are getting is a visual, uh, what I should say, illusion uh, because of the way scales are produced in the graph. Because you see, you have, since it grows very fast towards the end, I have to give you a scale which is of the order of, let's say in this graph, 3000, okay? And then a scale of where it's growing from one to two will not register in this case, okay? And that's why uh, this, when it grows up, will actually depend on how I have plotted. I can make the graph bigger and then you will see that even in the part where you are thinking that it's not growing, it's continuously growing and so on. So that's one. And the late rise, of course, is because the uh, rate of growth is proportional to the number itself. Uh, but the best way to look at any exponentials, and I would stress it again, is to look on a log scale, where you again will see a very, very straight graph, straight line graph. And uh, that's because the ratios are increasing by the same amount if you change x. Maybe, maybe uh, actually, Basu wants to have a uh, answer that as well. So, Basu, why don't you okay. do that? So, the question was, why does the exponential curve, when plotted on the usual scale, seem to increase very fast towards the end? And what really sets the scale for when it increases fast? That's the question. So in this uh, in this plot uh, that you see, you would say that the curve really increases fast after five. You know, so that's what you would say, right? And that, why is this now? Where is this five coming from? It comes from the fact that I'm only plotting on the vertical axis up to three thousand. So let's take a simple example. Imagine you have a pond where there are a lot of water lilies. Okay, the pond with lots of water lilies. And these water lilies multiply by a factor of two every night. And now the king has told you that at the end of the 30th night of the month, the pond will get completely filled with water lilies. And if that happens, you as the park cleaner lose your job. So your job as the park cleaner is to make sure that the pond is never full of water lilies. But of course, you're a very lazy person. So you want to clean the pond only as few times as possible. When would you clean the pond? So this is a quiz on Facebook. So if you can quickly answer, 30 day, the pond gets filled, doubles every night. You are a lazy park cleaner. When would you clean the pond? Any answer? So I'll wait 10 seconds. Oh, it's it's a yeah. bit uh, delay. I guess. Okay, so somebody says on the first day. Uh, no. Uh, okay. Well, on the first day, if you remove it, you just remove it. If you remove it, so clean means uh, let's say by cleaning you half the number of lilies. Uh, uh, so anyway, so the answer is on the 29th day, because on the 29th day. So the answer came on Facebook just now. One, two, three, four, twenty-nine. Anyway. Excellent. So a lot of people are getting it right. Uh, wonderful. We have a very, very educated audience here at Chai and Y. It's uh, fantastic to see that you've all got the right answer. On the 29th day, which is just a day before the 30th, the pond is half full. And so if you clean it out on that day, you're fine. So you only have to clean it once a month. Where does this number 29 come from? Because of this doubling, it means that since we are interested in keeping the pond clean and it fills up on the 30th day, most of the growth happens just you know, a day before. So same for this scale. This is a scale where things are growing at some rate. And you ask at how many days did it take or how many units in X did it take for this curve to become half of it? 
you know double of it and that is what sets where you start seeing the exponential growth on this plot maybe one thing will help if we go back one more slide here uh, you see the top left curve and the top right curve it is the same curve i am plotting the same function if i look at the top left because i have plotted up to 150 you might say well you know it shoots up from two if i let the x go up to very large and make it up to 2500 which is again the basically the red curve is the same red curve everywhere you can see that it looks like it's pulling up around three or four now however if i look at the same curve between zero and two which is the top right you will see that it simply looks like it's growing continuously so that's what is happening anyway. yeah. and uh, i have a comment on this uh, i'm not, not watching maybe that will work uh, so of course uh, uh, so of course, uh, so of course, uh, this is like an interest interest on um, on principal, right? So the interest you get is proportional to the principal. So the interest is ten percent. Of course, if your principal is small, if it's ten rupees, you only get one rupee of interest. If the principal is ten thousand, you get one thousand rupees of interest. So in the exponential curve, as you go further and further away, your principal, which is your current value, is larger. Therefore, the increase is larger, and you can see get the increase. So there's nothing um, uh, magical about this. It's just that because the principal is larger, you will get your interest larger. Then it depends on uh, whether you are satisfied with one rupee of interest or whether you want ten thousand rupees of interest. Oh, okay. There is a there's a question here. Um, the this is from Ajay. He claims that. In the growth curve, sometimes you see some oscillations. It is is it is the observation correct? Are there oscillations, or is it just something that uh, you feel like oscillations, but uh, are something else? Real data? You mean real data? Yeah, I think the, it doesn't say, but okay. Maybe so the question uh, is the question uh, which says that when one looks at uh, the growth of, let's say, number of coronavirus cases, or even if you normalize by other uh, useful things like number of deaths as a function of time, it seems that this number is fluctuating and oscillating around some smooth curve. Why does this happen? Yeah, or is this a real thing? And if so, why does this happen? Uh, this is a real thing. Uh, one of the reasons why this happens is because these data are reported in bunches and it could so happen that there was no reporting on a Sunday and then most of the reporting that happens on a Monday and all of these cases appear the very next day. And so typically what will happen is that every day you will feel that there is a, a slight decrease in the number of reported events, but then those numbers get filled up next day. And this leads to a feeling that the, you know, the curve is flattening, but then it doesn't quite do so, and it rises the next day. So this is a real thing. There is a very beautiful article on it in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. Uh, other factors may be in place. For example, uh, in India, on the 18th of March, there was a Janta curfew. I think that was the day, right? And then Saturday and uh, 22nd March. On the 22nd, 22nd of March, uh, there was a Janata curfew. And then we had a day or two uh, gap in between. And then there was a full lockdown after that. So typical social uh, activities uh, will happen in this gap period. In fact, just before the lockdown, you might expect a lot of people to crowd at uh, grocery stores, at, uh, let's say, uh, local transport uh, uh, centers and those would lead to a little bit more infections than would happen in the normal course of affairs and such things will then show up in your data maybe two weeks later when these people are then detected as uh, uh, being infectious so if there is a gathering that happened just before uh, lockdown was imposed because these people thought that this was their last chance to meet this would lead to a spike in the number of cases two weeks later and such things do happen and that's the reason why you see fluctuations on top of these smooth curves. 
uh, just one point to add please remember that these are the cases that has been detected and hence reported so that depends on whom you are testing and the testing strategies of different governments keep changing from time to time initially for example in india we were only testing people who had travel history and then now we are uh, in between we were uh, then testing people who had travel history and all their contacts whether now you have to whether you have to have symptoms to be tested so unless you test you may not find just one thing to remember this data is the number of people whom we have found to be infected by testing them clearly the number of actual people who are infected is much larger and when the models are running they are trying to get the numbers of actual people who are infected uh, whereas these things are can show bumps if you change your testing strategy for example so a lot of factors which are not in the models go into getting the actual data and bumpiness can come from many many such things okay so there's another question a very important question and uh, one that uh, uh, has been asked many times in other uh, places is can we say something about when the lockdown should end okay so this is a very important question uh, not because we can answer it uh, this is the last question that we'll take oh, no, no, no no yeah i mean yeah no sorry so uh, when should we end lockdown this is a very important question not because we can answer this question but because we must emphasize that nothing that we have told you in this uh, last one and a half hour answers that question this is a question that has many many facets one of the facets is a better modeling of the epidemic much more fine grained and much more detailed than we have done here is needed in order to even approach this question but there are other factors at play for example you have to think about the economy you have to think about how different sets of people in the country with different levels of resources and different social conditions how are they doing how are they being able to cope up with the lockdown so there are many many factors that go into deciding whether or not lockdown should be ended for how long will should there be a second lockdown all these questions are very important policy decisions that are taken on the basis of much more refined analysis than we have presented you but it's an important question uh, very generically lockdown helps as we showed in delaying the infection it also helps in reducing the load on hospitals but there are other things that one has to do in order to fully eradicate an epidemic okay let's see if there are any other questions yeah Which is facebook book? Yeah, Facebook is a combination of a couple of questions. Uh, I think one of the questions that is Pratima Gorka. So we have heard about this concept of herd immunity. Uh, what does that mean? And do this plot show it somewhere for various countries? And uh, yeah, how is it a part of your model? Can can some model have that vision? Okay. Uh, so the question is about herd immunity. Uh, so the idea is that if some fraction of the population gets infected and you know be, you know recovers from the uh, infection then even though there are a few infectious people hanging around you know on the whole the infection does not spread in the population anymore and most of the other people don't get the infection at all uh, this is included in the sir model uh, the level to which the population must get infected in order for the epidemic to stop depends on r not again in this model uh, in this as you see this blue curve is the total number of recovered people so actually uh, let's go back to the previous one so maybe this one so you see if you look at this red curve this is the number of infectious people uh, that is going to zero after about 50 days or so the number of susceptible people the people who have never had this infection has certainly gone down to zero but the number of recovered people you see it's gone to about 950 or so but it is not thousand so in this example not 
everyone has got the infection and then gotten cured. There are people who have never gotten infected. So this is even more apparent uh, 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 if you reduce R0. And there will be a time uh, after which what happens is that there are a few infectious people, but the probability of a healthy person meeting one of these uh, infected people becomes just too small. Of course, in, in the infinite time limit, everyone does get infected, but in any finite time, uh, that won't happen. So this is perhaps a question going maybe away. one one comment from uh, uh, from data from other epidemics not from this epidemic what people have seen is that about 60 percent of the population typically needs to get infected before hard immunity creeps in so of course the people have questions about uh, Okay, I want COVID, but there's a question which is completely independent of that. So yeah, same here. So there is a, a request actually is one of the questions is this uh, the model that you're playing with. Uh, could you share the code for generating these graphs and uh, that people can play with them in a graphing software or something? So uh, we can put it on the Facebook page or somewhere, right? So uh, of course, I'll uh, make available uh, the Mathematica uh, notebook that I use to generate uh, both the rabbit example and the SIR model example that I showed you guys. Uh, but I think many of you may not have access to Mathematica. Uh, however, this is something that uh, you can find elsewhere on the internet. So maybe we can provide links to those. But okay. we will share the file that I have used. Okay, so this question we can be answered by going to the slides of, uh, of viral videos. Ah. Gangnam, Gangnam rap and fun baby, question. Uh, whatever those, uh, baby Justin Bieber. Yeah, baby yeah. Justin Bieber. So from the slopes of these graphs, what can we see about the exponents? Uh, how how can we find exponents of these graphs uh, by looking at how so far they change? No, this is fine. I think this is fine. Yeah. Uh, this one. Quality. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, no, unfortunately there isn't. So unfortunately, uh, both of the viral video graphs that have been shown here are on a linear scale, where it is not so easy to look at the exponent. Uh, you see this region, uh, this this region at the very beginning of the black curve. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. Use the pointer tool. No, no, it's okay. That's that is the okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a physical pointer there. No, 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 but no it's on the screen. Okay, this is a bit hard to do because it's that moving. thing has to go away. The... Yeah. I can I move this away? No. Just, just maybe I use side. a different uh, plot. Maybe this oh, one is easier. So look at this one. So this is the Justin Bieber baby video. The initial curve here, you can see, this is a linear scale and it is it has uh, a bowl-like shape, if you see from the top, but then it becomes flat. This is a bit like the logistic curve that I showed you before. Same for the Gangnam style video, it has a, you know, concave uh, shape when you view from above it's a bowl like uh, shape and then it increases and then it'll also fl you know flatten down like this later so we let me modify the question because it also comes in some other questions maybe go to some plot where you have a log on the y-axis and numbers days on the x-axis and just indicate how you can determine the exponent in this by looking at that yeah. so, so anyway so but before we go there the idea is that if you see a sharper rise initially the exponent is larger so now this is much easier to do on a log scale as Rajdeep uh, told us so let's go to the very last plot that we saw yeah, this one now you see these the y axis here, the vertical axis is on a log scale and the horizontal axis is on the linear scale. These dotted lines which you see here, 
this one this one this one this one they are lines of constant slope which refer to the number of infectious cases doubling in a given number of days so the one which is on the left this one the cases double every day here the cases double every two days here the cases are doubling every five days on this one the one on which japan is roughly cases are doubling every 10 days so one thing to notice is that roughly all of the curves that you see here are straight lines initially so these are exponentials with some given exponent the if i read it off by i we see that japan cases are doubling about every 10 days so that's the exponent doubling every 10 days india it's something like about seven, uh, so it's a bit older uh, data uh, here it was around 3 3.5 later on now we have flattened and we are probably at seven days so doubling every seven days that's the recent data uh, from the european cdc uh, italy was doubling every roughly 1.5 days or so early in the epidemic now it has flattened substantially and it's doubling at somewhat longer than 10 days probably something like 15 or 17 days uh, and so on so if you look at the slope on this log curve that tells you the exponent that's the doubling time uh, another question perhaps to rajdeep uh, he mentioned somewhere that uh, uh, you can have negative exponents uh, and said he will do it later. Do you want to say something about it now, quickly? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why don't you talk about negative and complex? Okay. So yeah, we did not talk about negative exponents, uh, but partly because we were focused on growth. Negative exponents, let's see uh, if we can get to that slide. Okay, I did talk about it a little bit. Okay, so uh, negative exponents, two to the power minus n, or anything to the power minus n, let's say that thing, the base is positive, let's talk about that now, can be thought of as one divided by a to the power n or 2 to the power n okay so negative exponents is simply the following it's 1 divided by things with positive exponents now if positive exponents are exploding and they're going up very very fast what do you think will happen to a negative exponent it's as a denominator which is growing very fast numerator which is 1 so it will be going down very 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 fast and this leads to things called exponential decays, which are again things we see in various other cases, radioactivity, for example, and so on. But that's a topic for a different day and a different lecture. So uh, since Arnab asked me to uh, talk about this, uh, you can also have exponents that are not real numbers. So the most famous of them is e to the power i times pi which is minus one uh, so of course there's a lot more to learn about exponentials we've only covered uh, the simplest uh, kind of exponentials where you have a positive real number raised to the positive real number uh, there are other kinds of exponentials some of them are decaying some of them are oscillating uh, you will learn a lot more about them at uh, uh, upcoming H I and Y. Uh, we don't know when it will happen, but it will certainly happen. Uh, but with that, I think I'll hand over to uh, Arnab. Okay, so yes, I mean, hopefully you saw a little glimpse of exponentials when they go up. But as Basu just said, there is a whole world of fun stuff you can do with them. Uh, if you want us to have another sessions on exponentials which decay or exponentials which oscillate, you can connect the exponentials to sines and cosines and you know get into to trigonometry there are lots of fun stuff one can do with them let us know your comments on facebook or zoom and we'll try and have another session on exponentials because right now we are out of time and uh, we hope you enjoyed the session 
uh, do send us your questions. Do keep following us, and we'll be back again with another Chai and Why. We'll let you know on Facebook and uh, on Twitter uh, when it's going to be and what the topic is. The next one, most likely, is going to be back to biology. We are going to look at how does actually one of these things enter the cell. So that's going to be the topic next time. We're looking at. We'll let you know the exact details. Till then, stay safe. Keep physical distance, but stay in touch with people. Keep the social contacts with everyone. It's a hard time, we know, but we're going to get through this and get better. Okay, goodbye. And, 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 uh,